What you're about to hear in this deep dive on narcissism is not something you'll find on BetterHelp or Psychology Today. I think we're wired to submit to this like higher authority. And then there's the, those who want to see themselves as the gods, want to believe themselves as the gods, the messiahs, the gurus. I brought independent thinker Natalie Martinik onto my podcast to share her unique perspectives on interpersonal and societal narcissism and how to hack it. The market is saturated with people talking about narcissism, reading about narcissism, calling other people narcissists, and behaving like narcissists. In all this chaos and noise, how can we really know what narcissism is? Natalie is in a league of her own. She's a narcissism expert and biologist who writes extensively on her popular substack, Hacking Narcissism, approaching it in a really unique way. And she writes some of the most profound stuff on narcissism that I've ever read. So instead of being able to admit in the moment, I'm actually feeling helpless, I don't know what to do here, I'm going to do something else to make myself feel superior, better, powerful, which might have a negative impact on the other person. But I'm not saying that because I'm trying to find a way to make myself look good, feel good, comfort myself, soothe myself in this moment of deep discomfort. This conversation with Natalie will provide life-changing tools that you can use to improve your life and relationships and to influence your workplace, family systems, and society at large. If you enjoy this conversation, please subscribe to my channel, hit the bell to be notified of new videos, and share this with a friend. You can also subscribe to my mailing list on Substack to get access to my podcasts, videos, and tons of written essays you won't find here. Check the link in the description below. You know, just to say again, as we said off camera, when I came across your work, I found that it was really different. It was really profound. You write about hacking narcissism and in a way that's really, really different from how I see other writers approaching this topic. So can you tell me a little bit, like, why is your approach to narcissism so different? I think my approach to narcissism is so different than, I guess, the popular version of narcissism, which tends to point fingers at the perpetrator and see ourselves as the victim, um, is that we do a lot of the things that we're pointing fingers about to another person. We perpetrate these things, but in our victimhood, we can't see that in ourselves. Bullies, as we know, not to say that we're bullies, but bullies see themselves as a the victim. They cannot imagine that they're causing harm to someone else because they're still so focused on the way they feel and um, they're unable to step outside of themselves and observe their own actions and the impact that it's having. So we all have these traits. So if we want to see change in this world, we don't want to see bullying or, you know, bad behavior or hurt or, you know, things like that. We need to look at ourselves a bit more. So I tried to take an approach that is somewhat gentle at times, subtle, maybe too subtle, and sometimes a little bit more direct um, and in your face to raise our awareness of the things that we can change, which is our behavior. Can't change anything else outside of that. I think that this is really important. I mean, this is something that I can see in myself, that I can see in others around me. When you start to feel triggered or you start to feel hurt, it's you kind of immediately default into a victim position. And so then it's like it takes some self-awareness to kind of step back and look at the situation more for what it really is rather than placing yourself in that victim role and then seeing, oh, the other person is all wrong. And so therefore I need to change them. Right? That's kind of how it goes. Which is the narcissism, because as I talk about narcissism, which is different to, it's relational. I talk about interpersonal or relational narcissism. It's understanding the way we behave in, con in relational context. Um, and that will be different with the different people that we're with. In our attempt to make ourselves feel comfortable, we're going to potentially control other people's behavior um, for ourselves. You know, a typical example is when we have a friend or a peer who's in distress, who's, you know, reaching out to us to share their problem. Uh, one of the things most of us tend to do is leap into give advice and try to fix and solve their problem. What we're doing is being triggered by their suffering, 
And it's not a conscious thing a lot of the time. And we can't deal with that discomfort. So we try to alleviate our own discomfort through advising, solving, doing something that we think is being helpful, but might be invalidating the other person. It's not necessarily listening to them. Not It's making a whole bunch of assumptions about their understanding of their situation um, because, you know, it, we're doing a lots of things to bypass being with somebody, listening to them, you know, helping them unfold their story a bit more and trying to connect with them, empathize with them because of our own discomfort. And so that is, in essence, a way of controlling our own experience through controlling someone else's experience. To me, that's what I call narcissistic traits. And they're not necessarily intentional and they're not then intending to hurt someone. They're trying to help someone, but the impact might still be negative. Right. And then the other person kind of feels unvalidated, feels unheard, and then they go into kind of victim mode and then they behave narcissistically, right? I remember you you put this checklist in some of your articles where you say, notice the other person's behavior in this checklist. And then you say, when you feel triggered by their behavior, notice your behavior in this checklist. And then it's like, notice this is the same checklist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We just marry each other because we're we're just defaulting to this unconscious way of reacting to what you know what someone else is doing, and we tap into a you know perceptions um, about what they're doing to us that puts us in our that are the perceptions of a victimhood, and these are all catalyzed by shame. You know, I'm feeling inferior, inadequate. Uh, you know, powerless, helpless. So instead of being able to admit in the moment, I'm actually feeling helpless. I don't know what to do here. I'm going to do something else to make myself feel superior, better, powerful, which might have a negative impact on the other person. But I'm not saying that because I'm trying to find a way to make myself look good, feel good, comfort myself, soothe myself in this moment of deep discomfort. So you're basically trying to protect your own self-image. Yeah. Yeah. Which is narcissism. So let's talk about shame a little bit later, because you wrote a really great article that went into depth about shame again in a way that I'd never read before, which I thought was great, because I think a lot of people misunderstand shame. But first, Natalie, how do you define narcissism? So I define narcissism similarly to how, you know, others know of narcissism, which is a sense of entitlement, a desire for endless attention, affection, devotion, um, uh, control, dominance. But where I differ than sort of the mainstream popular way of thinking about it is that I see humans as relational creatures, and I'm not the only one who sees, it, sees us this way. So everything we're doing, we need to consider a relational context because the way I'm going to act with you, Kate, might be, you know, calm and great because that's, that's what you're helping me experience. I feel safe with you. Whereas with others where I feel insecure or, or competitive or envy, I'm going to act a bit differently. I'm still me, but I'm going to show up differently. And I'm going to show up with those people in a way that helps me feel better about myself. So I'm going to try to control, dominate, um, you know, control the way they see me so that I can see, continue to see myself in a positive light. But I may not do that with you, Kate, because I don't feel that inferiority or insecurity. So this relational narcissism is a need to dominate control uh, in order to feel good about ourselves. And um, but it's also to try to control how other sees our, others see ourselves. And we do this in a number of unconscious ways. And it's not necessarily intentional, which also quite differs a lot from the current understanding of narcissists and narcissism is that there's often an assumption um, or it's implied that people are, um, you know, intentionally or deliberately trying to hurt someone else, trying to control, dominate, rather than understanding it's our human condition. And um, we're always vying for power in a relationship unconsciously because this is part of our primal kind of security system of, of being. So this makes sense because we see a lot of, let's say just on YouTube, videos about narcissism, and it's always pointing towards the other person. There's also like a subcategory of like, I'm an empath, 
and the other person's a narcissist. And so it's very much kind of coming from this dichotomy, which maybe you're saying here is kind of like a false dichotomy that one person is the narcissist and the other person is totally innocent. But like, really, it's more nuanced than that. But is there also, you know, a line that you cross where a person is more narcissistic, you know, does have more of those traits and kind of that's a an ingrained way of behaving in most situations? Like, where do you draw the line? Yeah. So when I talk about, if I were to talk about someone who is more narcissistic, they're behaving in the ways you just described, more of a full-time gig in all their relationships. They cannot feel secure. They're constantly tapping into shame, but it comes out as arrogance or overconfidence. Um, they just can't feel at ease around anyone. They're not necessarily aware of this. It's just their, their full-time personality. Um, and we could say the same with people who refer to themselves as empaths. You know, a lot of empaths fall into the vulnerable or covert narcissistic set of traits, the spectrum of the, the narcissism behavior spectrum. And they uh, control others through their victimhood. Um, whereas the more grandiose, malignant style is a different, different approach. It's more overt, more obvious. Um, whereas the, yeah, so the empath is like, well, I'm a healer. I feel things deeply. I could tap into your, you know, psychic field and feel all the things that you're going through and even report some of the things that I'm seeing. Like, I, you know, I've seen this stuff. I've witnessed this stuff. I've even said this stuff. So you can imagine this is a way to control people, but the empaths come across as the innocent because um, it's easier to believe somebody who's more heart-centered and help-oriented to be the victim versus the one who doesn't seem to act in those ways because they're very self-centered, self-focused. So you were just saying that you've even viewed yourself that way. You know, I think anybody who going down the narcissism kind of rabbit hole, you know, tends to have this kind of empathetic nature in a way. You're kind of like, there's something going on that's not right. I want to understand this person. I want to understand myself a little bit better. So there is maybe that's where the word comes from, you know, um, and again, dividing people into like codependents versus narcissists, that like big divisive line that has no room for nuance. But so what happened to you, Natalie, for you to like really get into narcissism? Is that where you got into it through your own experiences? Yeah. I mean, I can't pinpoint one event that led me to that, um, led me to not just narcissism, but understanding power in relationships and what happens in our relationships that make us feel like shit, you know, that you can't always put your finger on. Um, but you know, it's there and you like, you have certain interactions where you feel shut down or low or guilty, uh, afterwards. And you're like, but nothing happened. The conversation seemed to go well. So, um, what happened to me, I think from a young age, I've always been, uh, picked on by other girls. So I have like lots of stories of, you know, primary, primary school years where I was excluded, where I was uh, picked, picked on, made fun of uh, for a number of different reasons. And that seemed to continue in, into high school in, in different ways. So at some point I wondered, well, what's wrong with me that this stuff's going on? But at the same time, in order for me to feel better about myself, I'd get into other friendship situations where people were weaker than me and I'd be able to dominate and feel, you know, better about myself. So I was doing to others what was being done to me, not at the level of severity because I never formed a big friend group where I was like excluding different people and being like the mastermind and puppet master of all of, all of that, which is what I experienced. But I was finding a way to compensate for my shame by doing unto others what was done to me that was hurtful to me. And then um, I entered grad school and then my postdoc um, as a biologist, a developmental systems biologist, and I started to notice some things in my face in, in the workplace culture. And that's when I started really noticing power dynamics and neglect and favoritism and golden child and things that look like a you know, dysfunctional family. And um, 
and I was studying metastasis and I was more interested in the metastasis of toxic behaviors around me than, you know, what was looking at, you know, my fruit flies and Petri dishes under a microscope. And then I'd left that. And, and, you know, I kept, once you start seeing something, you can't unsee it. And, um, you know, how people progress and ascend up a promotional ladder in any workplace hierarchy. When you look at their character and you're like, why are, how did you get that position? Or why did that person get slammed by all the faculty, but they're actually doing a good job? Like what caused this group of people to turn on them? So it was that the power dynamics and the power imbalances um, in an environment that is supposed to be full of mature adults that made me go like, you know, start questioning things. And then again, always looking at my own experience of um, different relationships, friendships, workplace relationships, where I felt like I don't fit, or something's wrong with me, or I keep feeling excluded. So I kept pondering like, what, what is wrong with me till I finally recognized, no, there's something wrong out there. There's something else that's contributing to the way I'm seeing myself and experiencing these relational dynamics. And that kind of, you know, again, got me more interested into interpersonal dynamics, power dynamics in a group, and then ultimately into interpersonal narcissism. It's the systems, right? I mean, there's um, Philip Zimbardo's famous Stanford prison experiment where, you know, there was a bunch of ordinary people. They said, we're going to divide you into groups. We're going to have the prisoners and then we're going to have the guards. And they were equal when they started and it quickly unraveled, including Philip Zimbardo. He got involved in his own experiment and really went to his head and became Machiavellian, basically. And it took somebody from the outside, actually, a woman that he was dating who he ended up marrying, who came in and saw what was going on and was like, what if, wh what are you guys doing here? You know, there's torture going on here. This is evil stuff. And you're part of it. And I don't want to be with somebody like you if this is what you want to do. And he kind of just, whoa, you know, the, the lid was taken off uh, and he started to kind of see and then wrote about it a lot. And, you know, this was an imitation of the Milgram experiment in a way, but to see whether systems enable that kind of behavior. So is that what you found? Yeah, because I became the person when I was, you know, fascinated by the metastasis of toxic behaviors in, you know, a biomedical academic setting, um, I was becoming that. I was that. And I started to feel worse and worse and worse about myself, even though all these other things seemed to be on track in my life. I just was feeling like the worst person on earth. And I was like, how did it happen? So once you step outside of that and you start seeing it in other contexts while not being involved in those interactions, you start to see the things that you experience and you're able to analyze it from a, again, a more of an outsider perspective. And yes, yeah, systems co-opt our souls, basically. If we're unable, we're, if we assume we're in a, in a great place where, you know, we're going to thrive and everyone's nice and no one has any other agendas, um, but you progressively become assimilated into that system and you start to perform and act and embody the system's traits, the cultural traits. And you mentioned something interesting just now when you were um, talking about that experiment and that it took an outsider to have influence on kind of the ringleader, the mastermind of this project to say, hey, I don't want to be with you if you're going to be evil like this. So this is the thing that can wake people up if there's a you know, strong enough influence, there's enough of an incentive to question yourself because most people don't question themselves if they think they're doing a good thing. They're studying something that is important and, uh, you know, it's good for their reputation. It's good for whatever it is that they see as val valuable, their status, prestige. But if there's something that seems more prestigious, more important, that says, wait a minute, something's wrong here. And I don't like the person that you are as a result of what you're doing. I'm, I'm out. That's a pivotal point for that person. It can be a catalyst for them to kind of wake up. And um, I wish more of that was happening. But that's, you know, people don't change unless there's a motivation to, to change. And so that story highlighted the motive. 
So it's kind of like these checks and balances on like a natural inclination that humans have when they get into a group. Is that how you would see it? Yeah. If we are coming in naive and we just assume, like I said, you're going to have a good time, you're going to be able to achieve success or fulfill the goals. If you're not aware that every single culture is the same kind of hierarchical can be a, a hierarchical, corrupted hierarchy, um, where you will become assimilated into that culture to be a practitioner of the exact same things that you would have initially um, never imagined yourself doing and never wanted to see yourself doing. You will become it because you're not, you're naive. You're not looking at the things that uh, can potentially corrupt you and trying to resist it and doing the different thing, something different. Um, so, that's, I think, the difference. So we all will we'll all assimilate, assimilate into a workplace culture, a friend group, a family system, uh, a community, a cult. Doesn't matter if you're coming in naive. So then, is that the antidote to not be naive, to go in there, kind of understanding these dynamics and being able to kind of see them in real time, or like reflect upon things that happen and say. I wonder what's going on here. Like, is that how you insulate yourself from becoming assimilated? I think one is you accept that this is just the reality. And this is coming from me. Others might disagree, but this is from my experience. This is just the reality. There isn't equality. That doesn't exist. We're all different. We all bring different things to the table. And some people are really self-aware and conscious of the power that they hold and the influence that they have on others and don't want to manipulate people with it or don't want to be coercive or forceful. They want to be mutual, reciprocal. Um, but those are rare in my experience to have that, those people really switched on. Um, so you've got to be that person. So you accept reality and then you just assume there's some key relationships in this, in this situation or in this organization that if I were to, you know, interfere or disrupt it in some way, I would be viewed as a threat. So I need to be conscious of the relationships that are, you know, no go zones that I don't need to be someone's best friend because they're the most powerful one in the group. I can, you know, see everyone as valid, important, and I can, you know, be that person without being the threat in the situation because we know what happens when we're threatened when we threaten someone who's in a position of power or in close close proximity and dependent um, on that position of power you become uh you know a target and um and they'll want to eliminate you and restore the social order that existed so those are the dynamics that un you know are inevitable that we've got to just resist and, and not try to be loved and accepted and uh, validated by everyone. It's kind of an inside job and you go in and you stay focused on what you need to get done while having, you know, trying to form relationships, you know, um, healthy and positive relationships with others. It's like what you're describing there is essentially the scapegoat, right? Which is kind of like a tale as old as time. Uh, Rene Girard, as you know, in some of my work, I've been talking about him. And he says, like, this is actually like civilization advanced because of scapegoating. It was like, it was a way for people to release their tensions onto somebody else. And usually the scapegoat is the one who comes and says, hey, there's a problem with the status quo somehow. You know, they're kind of like the truth teller or, you know, they're somebody who is really pursuing the truth at all costs and they disrupt that status quo. So you're saying that like, if you want to survive in this kind of hierarchical system where there's some toxic behaviors playing out, which you're saying are kind of inevitable eventually in this kind of group setting, work setting, family setting, um, you just have to either adapt to it or be willing to call it out and have an exit plan? Are those basically the two choices? <laughs> For, uh, yeah. Um, or if, you ha if you're in a position of influence, you have a certain status, then you can try to cultivate a he healthy culture where, you know, you're overriding those uh, tendencies to uh, that can become toxic, those power differentials, because you're creating, and I hate the term psychologically safe, but that's, that's a safe what, space. Yeah. Safe space. Yeah. None of that, but <laughs> uh, of that, 
kind of vibe where you are trying to intentionally form relationships with other people that there's, you're quite um, explicit expectations of each other. You're transparent. There's honesty, openness, um, ability to challenge, ability to reflect, uh, you know, reflective culture where we're all here to learn from each other. There's no one better person than the other. And, you know, I have experiences with that. That That is my lived reality, thankfully, but that is something that is constant work. You constantly have to reflect and not in a laborious way. It's actually joyful. It's exciting to do this with people who have a similar approach. And you want these relationships where, you know, you can say anything and um, the other person won't feel offended. Um, but we're conscious about our language and how we want to communicate ideas to the other person, especially if it's about your experience of them or your observations of their behavior and the impact that it has, because you're wanting to encourage them to reflect on themselves and consider what they might want to change, if anything at all, um, so that we can continue to kind of co-create and maintain, sustain this trusting um, group culture. But that doesn't happen unconsciously it is quite a deliberate um effort it's constant um so that's the third option <laughs> and it's that's possible good news. yeah that's good great news. Yeah. yeah and this this is something that you do right something i do and it's uh i do my own work but also i i work in a, in a part of an organization and this is our team culture and um yeah so it requires some you know, great frameworks that can support you to do the practice, but the practice is what matters most more than any theory. So if we kind of bring it to a more personal level and think about families or just relationships, you know, which is like a microcosm of what you're describing here. It's like you have relationship, families, work environments, communities, society at large right like it just kind of it's like all these patterns that just come from like that those first relationships right and how you and how you interact with people like is it possible then to have healthy relationships to have healthy families like how prevalent is this yeah uh, I think it's possible um but I think uh unless your family is what I just described before where you have this culture where you can say anything and everyone will be, you know, reflective, examine our actions, happy to challenge each other. I haven't seen a family like that, that does it where there's, you know, no flaws and um, everyone's happy and harmonious. Like there's going to be conflict. That's a normal part of life. And that's important. Like, as you said, you could see the conflict as the scapegoat. It's the thing that catalyzes, uh, uh, you know, disrupts status quo, quo and gets us thinking about how, you know, whether or not status quo is working and what we can do differently. So it's necessary. But, um, you know, our family of origin is our template uh, for all our future relationships and the role. So I could talk about the roles that we play within the family structure is also the role that is like the stamp, the rubber stamp that will be, you know, executing in all our relationships. But it's not 100% of the time. It is also dependent on what the other person in the relationship brings. Because if you are with a person um, who reminds you of the parent who was always criticizing you and uh, making you feel bad about yourself or questioning, you know, your parents or questioning anything about yourself, that friend, you know, that you're gravitating to, who reminds you of that parent may not be an uncomfortable thing because it's quite familiar to you. You're not seeing it as bad until you've had other influences in your life that don't talk to you like that, don't treat you like that, and get you help you realize like, ah, I can exist in a relationship in a different way where that doesn't isn't part of it. And I don't need that to make me feel good. Actually, I'm realizing hearing those things about me make me feel bad about myself, makes me feel ashamed of myself, humiliated. And so that a cognitive dissonance is again part of the awakening process. Um, so yeah, we're our, we have our family of origin, and there's so many different frameworks to understand a, a family system. You spoke about the scapegoat. So there's, is it one scapegoat in a family? Anyone could become a scapegoat in the family if they don't do what the leader of the family wants um, or expects. 
So families can be hierarchical and they are hierarchical. You have parents, but there's also hierarchy between the spouses if there are two parents in the family. Um, and then everyone in the family stratified into this social order and nobody chooses a social order. It is again, a template from the parents uh, own family of origin that they're just, you know, recreating um, or reliving. And so the ch children, everyone plays a different role, but they're, the role can be fixed. And that role, like I said, can be the role you play in all your future relationships until at some point you recognize that that role is detrimental to you. And you don't want to be the nurturer for everyone. You go into a career as the nurturer, as like a nurse or a doctor, and you put your own needs aside. You're sacrificing yourself all the time. You eventually maybe get sick and there isn't, you know, a known treatment or a treatment that's helping. So it forces you to go down a more personal development path to work out, ah, this, this is the thing that I've been doing and I've been neglecting myself all my whole life. So I need to make a change. I need boundaries. I need to say no. I need to, you know, no longer have certain people in my life. I need to come out of that role of the nurturer. I don't need to be that nurturer in order to be loved or to survive or to do well in my life. I've done that. It's got me to this point. I need a different role now. So basically, it's as if we're kind of like repeating this relational template, like trying to relive it to resolve it. You know, I've read about that a little bit. And you just kind of end up in the same cycles with different people, like projecting your family members onto your partners or your friends and like being triggered by them. And then just like, it's all kind of unconscious chaos. <laughs> yeah, because the other person's doing that with us. They're they're projecting their relational templates onto us. So we're, you know, in this sometimes between friends, we're in this parent-child dynamic or between ourselves and like a manager at work. You're now like somehow you've become the parent and they're the child. Like, what? What's going on here? So it's confusing because this is the stuff that we're bringing. It's the baggage that we bring into all our relating. <laughs> yes, yes. So how do we, you know, I mean, it's one thing to understand it intellectually, you know, and in the, in the work that I've done, I've done a lot of work on myself. And as I said, I've read a lot of books and I've practiced different things to change my my kind of way of responding. But like, it's, it's really, really difficult to not just like be like, Oh, I understand the whole intellectual framework. And that's cool. And now my life's going to be great. And then like, you find yourself the next week being super triggered, being reactive, the next hour, you know, you close your book, and you're like, or you're like, why are you interrupting me while I'm reading, you know? And uh, so so why is it so hard for us to change? Oh, well, I think it's hard for us to change because we have to move through that cycle, you know, that cycle of steps of change going from, you know, being coming aware of the thing that you are. This is the role that I'm, that I've played in my family system. I've always been the black sheep, for example. Um, it's not easy to stop being the black sheep because other peoples are dependent on you being the black sheep and you've developed dependency on being the black sheep. So you have to kind of come to terms at first with, oh, I'm the black sheep. That's the role I've played. Okay. Okay. That's the first step. And then the second step is, okay, what do I need to do differently to no longer be the black sheep, but also me doing something different. I need to prepare for the backlash and retaliation because everyone's going to be threatened by this, you know, disruption to the status quo. Um, and that's going to make my life very difficult because no one wants me to change. Everyone's benefiting from me being in this role or they feel safer because I'm in this role because that's all they know. So there's lots of steps that are required to facilitate a change and it can't be done on our own if we've never done this before. How do you come out of, how do you suddenly know how to come out of a role that you've always played? Bim, you can't. You need somebody to be able to help you kind of go through the process because likely they've gone through the process and they can help you spot the pitfalls or prepare for the, you know, predictable outcomes and, and how to pivot and how to respond differently. Um, and then you start to learn the patterns yourself and then you become more confident in being able to disrupt status quo and do the different things. And that all of that process is part of a change, a change process. One of the things that I find a little bit intimidating about that, like let's say therapy or somebody to help you to change your patterns. And this is a little bit of a kind of 
tangent here on what you're saying, but it's what we were talking about at the beginning of our chat is there's like a lot of ideological capture in the world of psychology now. So like we also see that there's a lot of therapists, for example, who maybe let the ideology kind of creep into what they're doing. Like maybe it's woke ideology, which is the more prevalent one now. It could be a conservative form in two decades, but it happens to be kind of a more leftward um, focus now. So like, how do you, how do you go about finding the right person to do this with? Yeah, that's a good question because, you know, for change, I wouldn't think therapy. Therapy is more, a lot of the time, mental cognitive processing, but that's one change. You still need the behavioral change. I see that more in the realm of coaching and, um, coaching, not the rah, rah, inspirational, motivational speaker coaching, but the ones who know how to step, who support, help you support a change process and, um, and change happens. The ability to take the first step, you know, you need to be ready, you need to be prepared, you need to be resourced, you need to have some level of confidence. So somebody who can kind of hold your hand. So with me, I do that with my friends. So I, you know, we'd, we've been doing this with each other, we've kind of learned this way, or they've learned my thinking, because I've they're They've been my soundboards for all these years. And at the same time, they're, they're absorbing and they're taking it all in. They're applying it in their own life. So that's giving them confidence. So we're kind of walking along together. So it helps to have a peer in your life where you, who you can do that with rather than, you know, some professional person. But if you don't have that peer, um, you know, you do need somebody to, to help you through it. So if you're not interested in, you know, an ideological version to help describe your suffering and your victimhood because you're not that interested in the external locus of control where it's like the systemic problems, racism problems, anti-Semitic problems, like it's there. It's always been there. It's always going to be there. I think there's, you need the person who could go, okay, yeah, that's a reality. We can acknowledge it. We can look at how it's influenced you, but ultimately Let's look at the resources you do have, resources that are internal, the resources that are relational, um, you know, social, financial, and see what we can do to help you, um, to support you to create that change. So looking for someone who maybe speaks like that. That makes so much sense, Natalie. And uh, I feel relieved <laughs> because... <laughs> Because I'm thinking like, oh, man, sometimes it'd be nice to to have somebody to help me to do these kinds of things. Because what you're describing, and one of the reasons I love reading your work, is it really kind of speaks to the kinds of things that I'm trying to do all the time in my own life, you know. And I really believe that it's a process. Um, but sometimes I feel like, you know, I have my partner that, you know, we're aware of these things and we do these things together. But besides that, sometimes I'm feeling like I'm just kind of figuring out alone. So is there also a way to to do a lot of this work by yourself? Like I also believe that it has to come from here too. Yeah. So that's my that's been my life. I haven't had a therapist or coach or somebody to hold my hand to help me understand the experiences of suffering that I had that were not, you know, they weren't caused by some event. There were just periods in my life where I was like, what the you know, feeling like crap and not understanding why I felt like crap when all these other things seemed to be going okay. I needed to figure that out. So I guess what has helped me is that I have people who I trust who are the soundboards and through helping, you know, their skill and asking me certain questions and summarizing back what they've heard. You know, they're not being these like magnificent therapists with the therapy speak. They're just listening and being there for me and caring. And, you know, they might present an alternative theory, something that sparks something in me. So that, that, you know, helped me gain some insight, but ultimately I'm the one who has to take a risk and do something different. And yeah, I felt many times I'm grappling in the dark all alone. And even though I have lots of people who love me around me, I'm still doing this on my own. I, it's up to me. And then over time going through this over and over again, I started to see a pattern. So that's when it was like, okay, relief. Now I can share this information with other people who are going through something. I can recognize the phase they're in from what they're saying to me and the experience they're having. But ultimately, we have to 
it's solo work um, in the execution of, uh, you know, a change, but we have to get all that support from people around us. And I don't believe we need to like constantly look for external resources. I believe we have the resources there. We just have to access them maybe better, more effectively. That's really great because I think that, you know, focusing on the individual, like I've read a lot of Carl Jung and, you know, other other people who talk about it having to start with the individual, like I'm very much a classical liberal, so like Hayek. So whether it's politics, economics, ideology, philosophy, you know, everything else kind of stems out from that one person who's able to kind of see themselves as clear as they can and 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 try to do things to become better, right? So what does it look like what does it feel like when you're making a different decision? Like, let's say you're triggered. You're like, oh, you're about to react. How does it actually feel to like do something different? You probably won't do something different. For, like, so say, for example, you know you're reactive when someone treats you a certain way because it reminds you of a time you're with your father and this is the kind of stuff that you experience with, with that person. So you told yourself, I don't want to be that person. I want to be someone who can respond calmly when I'm feeling that way because of the reminder of my, my father. This is an example. So you're going to go through reacting a few times, but you're going to have the awareness that shit, I reacted. I didn't want to react. And I'm going to, you know, hate myself, shame myself. And then eventually, hopefully I'll stop doing that and go, okay, I'm on my way to responding differently. So um, I think that in itself, that process and starting to normalize that process in yourself reduces your reactivity the next, you know, as those, you know, triggers happen. So you're more likely to respond in a way where you can have the space now to take a breath and go, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that person drag me into that drama that they don't even know they're drag they're dragging me into. It's my own conflict, my own drama. And I'll respond calmly and I'll ask a question. So can you tell me what you mean by that instead of defending myself, which is the reaction? I, you know, I try and practice this. And so one of the things that I've done as well sometimes, I wonder if you do this too, is I just like try and zoom out and look at the other person and say like, if if I'm triggered right now, it's likely that they've done something because they're triggered, right? Like those things that make us, you know, not make us feel reactive, but that, you know, we we do react to or we do feel triggered by. Usually it's something that like there's a tone of voice or there's this something in there that makes you think like, Oh, like you said, this person's being just like my dad. But you're not really thinking about your father, but you're just like, what's what's wrong with them? You know, you right away you go to blame the other person and victimize yourself in your mind. But like sometimes I just say, Huh, that's interesting that this person is is saying this thing to me right now. And I sometimes the easiest thing for me to do is just not talk in that moment, just stay silent and just let it just fall. Yeah. So you let that charge dissipate by not saying anything, not even acknowledging anything about it. It just, or you can acknowledge internally, like, oh, I'm feeling this tension in my body. Yeah, it's wise to not need to say anything, but it does take a lot of restraint, as you've mentioned, to be able to know, oh, yeah, that tone is triggering me. I don't like it. It's, you know, it's, it's triggering all these constructs about myself that I don't like. I'm in my shame. And I want to, you know, control their perception of me. So I'm going to do the things I normally do. But what you're saying is quiet or um, take a pause. Yeah, it's powerful. So, so why do we want to control other people's perception of us? Why is that so important? Yeah, why, well, why is it important? Why do we care what other people think of ourselves? Why does it matter? Um, unless you're running a business or, you know, you're online and you have all these other people who are, 
you know, trust you. You don't want anything to get in the way of that trust because it's linked to your survival. It's linked to your success. So those are reasons we'd be upset that somebody's thinking negatively uh, that we want to control uh, their image of us and our own self-image. But where did that come from? You know, where, where did it matter? When did it start to matter that others had a positive perception of us? When did we start to care? And I know there's lots of people who never cared and they do their thing, but I'm not one of those people. Of course I care what other people think of me, um, but I care more about the people I value and I respect and I know how they think about me than those who don't because they're just projecting their, you know, image they demonize or devalue me based on their experience of me. So nothing I can do about that. But yeah, that's an answer. <laughs> so so when it's like that person, let's say it's your friend, or let's say it's your partner, or let's say it's your child, or somebody who like really means a lot to you. Um, why is it that, let's say if you know that you're in your values, and you talk about this in your shame article, okay? So maybe we can get into a little bit about that. But you're doing something that's in line with your values. You're pretty much on the right course, but they respond badly to it. They react to you when you're kind of in your right mind. Afterwards, you know, you can either kind of remain moored to your values and stay confident and realize the other person's going through something that has nothing to do with you. Or like on the other side of that is kind of like, I guess what you describe in your article as absorbing their shame, right? Over like your behavior that's, that's behavior that's in line with your values. Yeah. So what you've done is disrupted status quo. So they're reacting to that disruption. So they're, they're triggered into shame, guilt. So you're, and so the other part of it is going back to a relational understanding where if you were on the receiving end of, you know, crappy behavior, um, being talked down to, being diminished, being, you know, controlled, and you are the one trying to implement a change by responding to that person differently. So you're breaking the pattern or you're disrupting the pattern in an attempt to break it they're going to feel threatened, danger. What's, what's going on here? This I've never experienced this before. The predictable outcome isn't occurring. What is this? So they're going to start to if, experience the shame, their own shame spiral. And if they're the dominant one in the relationship, because again, there isn't necessarily equality, there's inequality in a hierarchy, uh, a dominance-based hierarchy. If they're the one who've been in control, it's like their emotions kind of try to control your emotional state. Um, because you're connected, you're emotionally connected through this bond, whether you want it or not. Um, so their experience of shame, it's like it, it transmits into your, like you experience it vicariously. So you're experiencing it as your shame, but it's not your shame because you did something that you wanted to do, that you planned to do, that was aligned with you, uh, that you felt good about. So why now, why do you feel bad about it now? It's not your stuff, but this is, I'm, you know, this is in a realm that some might call woo or it's like, you know, transpersonal psychology or what, whatever. But this is, again, through my own experience of understanding, why do I feel crappy after I've done something really good and positive for myself? Um, it's not mine, you know, because I'm connected to this person and I'm trying to break this pattern where this person owns me, where this person you know, overpowers me. I'm trying to create some shared power that they're not going to want because it doesn't serve them. It doesn't meet their needs. The way things are meets their needs, but it's not meeting mine. So that's why we, ex I think we experience this and knowing this isn't my shame. This isn't my guilt. This is not my stuff. And being able to take a moment and just kind of breathe and just let that charge pass or discharge then you come back to yourself again. You realize, okay, that's, I was temporarily possessed by this person's emotional state. Now I'm back in my own. So it's kind of like um, a codependency shame in a sense, right? Like you're kind of wanting to put their feelings above yours. And so you feel their shame 
over not kind of doing that, over prioritizing yourself, right? Yeah. You're still trying to protect them. You're still trying to justify their actions. It's not consciously done, but it's, again, when we enter into these relationships, it is like a parent-child dominance or a master-servant kind of relationship where my survival, my well-being, my ability to succeed in, in life is dependent on them. So I'm going to still protect them, even though they're perpetrating these things that are hurting me. So let's talk now actually about perpetrators. Okay. So let's say the people who are problematic, who are either narcissistic most of the time, or maybe even personality disordered because, you know, they're just kind of frozen into that state, I guess, and it's become their personality. Like, how do they um, perceive relationships? I guess it's a hard question. I have to kind of think back, okay, when I was more like those states, I think some people look, some so the people that you describe, they see relationships as resources, as things that, useful things um, that can serve their goals, so, you know, help them achieve their goals. So they're resources. They're not, you know, humanized things. They're, they're things that may help me attain what I want, help me grow in my status and my power, prestige, influence, attention, affection, the things that matter to me, fame, you know, quite material things. And they're not necessarily spiritual things, although you do have those kind of spiritual narcissists where they think they're, they're getting, you know, the godly goods um, through their allegiance or their alliance with another person. Um, so relationships are resources. That's the, the short end, the short, short answer. <laughs> it's hard, I guess, obviously, to put yourself like you're trying to go back to a time where, you know, you were maybe feeling like you were behaving more narcissistically to try and get into that kind of person's shoes. But it's hard because like it's hard to know what it's like, I think, to be really detached from yourself in a way. And that's, I think, also, right, how people who are very narcissistic feel? They're detached from their, they don't have a true sense of self. There's a constructed sense of self. There's the ideal self. There's the fantasy self, but that's viewed as reality. So anything that they experience outside of that fantasy reality is seen as a threat. And so the effort is in trying to restore the sense of self self that uh, fits that fantasy so anyone who criticizes them it, they are you know breaching the fantasy so those people become immediate threats and enemies um, unless that person is in a great position of power that that narcissistic person needs then they put up with it but they will find a way to retaliate there will be some revenge along the way just don't know when and that person in position of power doesn't know it yet but they're going to be toppled in some way or exploited or, or taken advantage of if possible. So because that person's a resource. That's it's so funny. Do you think that this kind of behavior dominated like in the past when we were cavemen? Is this like what, where does it all come from does it come from living in in you know agricultural societies when we all got together like has that become more dominant like you know we see a lot of our leaders are obviously very narcissistic even malignant narcissists yeah i mean i think this is part of a, a tribal way of being where there's you know person different levels of responsibility but there's like a tribal leader um or religion as well as so religious hierarchy, religious orders. Um, I'm thinking, you know, my own kind of like typical idea of a Christian order. Um, so Western and that there's, you know, the God, everyone is trying to be God or looking for their God. So I think that's, that's the, um, the dichotomy. So looking to, to, I think we're wired to submit to this like higher authority. Um, and, it doesn't have to be God. It could be money. It could be uh, science. It could be any sort of ideology. It could be a person. It doesn't matter. It's the state. 
the state, doesn't matter what it is. Um, and then there's the, those who want to see themselves as the gods, want to believe themselves as the gods, the messiahs, the gurus, um, who lack an ethical framework in which to be able to lead and support people through, uh, you know, a process of character development and growth and, you know, increased ethical conduct and, you know, adherence to ethical principles. So I think in the absence of um, caring for a community thriving and, per, you know, its perpetuity and uh, some sort of moral or ethical principles, you're going to have the narcissistic behavior because it's all about me, my gain, my aims, me. I'm the God. So maybe what happened too is like when we were living in tribes, you know, that was kind of, there was those dominance hierarchies like we see now in families, but like once civilization grew, then like all of those people were the, you know, the most dominant became the gods and the kings and, and now the, the politicians. Yeah. It's like feudal system. It's like wherever you see a hierarchy where there's some king or God or authority, um, and this comes back to what I talk about, <coughs> excuse me, as always, narcissism is also, we got to look at our relationship with authority and like authority, I said, can be anything, could be, you know, this higher being, it could be a higher purpose. It can be an ideology, a state, a person, doesn't matter. Um, but our template for authority is from, you know, our earliest experiences of authority between ourselves and a parent or caregiver that's where that's established. And so we're just kind of looking, I think, looking for love, affection, protection, nurturing, be told we're wonderful, amazing, um, you know, worthwhile, valuable, important creatures and seeking that out everywhere. And we're just keep replaying these stories. So this is what I think is the narcissism. It's like, I need this and I'm going to do what I need to do in order to have these experiences and to override that sense of shame. But the problem is I'm not overriding that sense of shame that's driving these behaviors. I'm in it all the time. I'm just not aware of it. You know, some people say that society has become more narcissistic over the last few generations. Like I know there was a book written about the boomers being narcissistic. Then it's like the millennials are the narcissists. Now it's like the, the Never zoomers the Gen are X. the narcissists. Never the, the Gen, Gen X. X. No, we're all right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you guys, I guess you're the black sheep. That's yeah. in the family system. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, I mean, is it, is it true, fine. do you think? Um, uh, I, I don't, I think society has become, if we look at the way things are, and social media is kind of a big, um, yeah, it's a big voice piece of, Western culture, I think that's, that's what I see anyway. Uh, you can call it, you know, Josh Slocum is also on Substack. He, he's got the term cluster B society. So it's a highly narcissistic society. It's all about me, my feelings. I should have a voice. I should have my say. You need to hear me. If I feel it, you need, I can say it. You know, there, there's been a loss of the sense of, or loss or isn't, um, the sense of responsibility that the things that we say, the ideas we put out there have an influence and have consequences. And what am I putting out there that's going to have a positive consequence? <laughs> because just because I think it and feel it, uh, you know, that's, that's positive. Um, this entitlement to our feelings and uh, entitlement to others listening to us and, and giving us space and giving us safety. And that, that I don't feel was in my childhood, in my teenage years, in my 20s at all, or my 30s. Yeah. So that's no. more recent. I'm a millennial. I'm sorry to say now that I know that you see Gen X as superior. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that we were like the apparently the coddled generation, right? And, and we're kind of responsible for a lot of this stuff. Um, and the boomers in that way, too, I guess, because they were the coddlers. You know, there's Jonathan Haidt's book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Uh, but that's also like the late millennials or even the the uh, the Gen Zs. And so, like, you've written an article called The Social Injustice Warrior, Introducing the Social Injustice Warrior. So that is kind of bred from that narcissistic kind of template 
can you explain what the, what that avatar is? Yeah, so it's a person that feels entitled to a position of leadership. They self-anoint um, or they interpret other people's support <coughs> as uh, endorsement for their rise into gurudom. Um, and so they, they uh, you know, have an ideology and um, or they've gone through something like we all do. We've had a loss. And instead of processing that loss and, and you know, understanding that it's going to change, create a change in your own identity. They adopt a new identity. They find something. And it's, again, it's not necessarily uh, deliberate. I'm going to become this new person. Sometimes it is, but it's just, they capture, they've been captured by something and they start to feel passionate strongly about it. And they want to make a difference. I want to make a difference. So they have humanitarian values. That's, that's a distinction with the social justice warrior versus other types of, I don't know, activists. Um, so they have humanitarian values. They are leveraging language of morality and, uh, you know, um, ethics and uh, respect and trust and faith, but they're intentionally creating an issue um, or they're tapping onto an, an existing issue or movement where they create an oppressor group and an oppressed group. And somehow they're neither in it or they identify as having been the oppressor or are the oppressor oppressor. Like for example, you know, white fragility came out. So all white women are the oppressor. And, you know, so we have to be allies, good allies to be able to, you know, fix things. And so that's, you know, one example. <laughs> so they create this oppressor oppressed group so that they have a role to play in saving the oppressor. So they're self-appointed anointed messiahs, um, but they're really in it for themselves. So they're the communal narcissist who comes across as humanitarian, but they're only there to feed their ego, but don't believe they are. They believe that they're there to fix something, solve something, resolve something, but they don't have a clear idea of the steps that need to happen and um, how to mitigate unintended consequences and to basically live by the tenet of do no harm. And you see, you know, there are professionals like doctors, nurses, uh, therapists who fall into the category of social injustice warrior, which is sad given, you know, they have been highly trained and skilled people who are taught about ethics. And um, yeah, they are, they know not to do harm, but they, they just can't, they're so captured. They don't, they don't consider that what they're doing could potentially be harmful to themselves as well as the people that they're attempting to help or save. And do you think that there's kind of a reason why it's, you know, you're talking about now professionals who have been dragged into this or who have chosen to be a part of this template, but what about the youth? Is there like a certain kind of propensity for young people to be a little bit more narcissistic before they kind of fully develop, you know, like relational awareness? Is that part of it too? Yeah. And I don't see why we expect youth to not be narcissistic because children are narcissistic. If we think about babies are narcissistic for using that language because they're fully dependent on attention, affection, you know, nurturing, nourishment, externals. And so children continue on that traje trajectory and depending on the parenting and the caregiving experience that they had to support them to develop independence and regu emotional regulation, they're just going to continue on that trajectory of me, me, me meeting my needs uh, or other people meeting my needs well into adulthood. So it does require, you know, certain influences and inputs to support the children to become independent, undeveloped character and uh, regulate themselves and, you know, not be entitled people. It's the same thing with mean girls, you know, the mean girl phenomenon in adolescence where, you know, I was victim of that. I was perpetrator of that. Uh, and they don't, if there haven't been consequences for wrongdoing, those mean girls become the corporate bullies in the workplace. They haven't grown out of it. There has been no incentive to change. They've gotten away with it. So unless there's some specific inputs throughout a, a child's developmental trajectory to support them to be more pro-social, 
they're just going to continue. So why would we be, be surprised that there's so many, you know, youth are going to be youth, they're going to be narcissistic. You know, something that you just brought up there too about Mean Girls, you know, made me think as well about the the scene where finally like the Mean Girls are exposed, you know, with their book, the the burn book. And they're held accountable as well by the institutions, by their school. And this kind of comes back to the beginning of our conversation where we're talking about that kind of like institutional uh, kind of hierarchies and setups that uh, enable this kind of narcissism. So I think what we're seeing now with the institutions, with the colleges, with the universities, with the elementary schools, you know, with all kind of areas of life that are outside of the household, is that these kids are basically being held unaccountable for anything, you know, and they're being they're being pushed into this kind of narcissistic model, you know, they're being indoctrinated to do these kinds of things like the social justice, which is also like neo-Marxist stuff, which I mean, um, and you've, you've kind of written on the peripheries about that. So like, what do you, what do you think the influence of that kind of indoctrination is? Uh, it gives people permission to be their worst, but makes them think that they're being their best. Because there isn't accountability. There isn't somebody that they're willing to listen to or have to listen to that's telling them, actually, what you're doing is harmful. What you're doing makes you look like an idiot. What you're doing is not having the impact you think it's having. Um, but there has to be, you know, there, there isn't, I think, the erosion of trust is also accompanied by erosion of respect. And so people are like, just entitled. I don't have to listen to you. I'm, you know, I have a platform, I have attention, I have an audience, uh, I'm maybe monetized. So I'm being incentivized to keep doing this. What makes you think that your, your position is better than mine or, you know, more important than mine? Who are the authorities? Where have they gone? That's a really good question. And it's like, you know, coming back again to this Philip Zimbardo, his girlfriend at the time coming in and saying, what are you doing here? It's like, there's no longer that voice coming in. You know, we just saw with Harvard, Claudine Gay, that whole yeah. fiasco. <laughs> it's like the people who are, yeah, <laughs> who are leading these institutions, um, they're not there to be authoritative. So this is why I, I write about bullying, because this is what bullies do. They become the authority when they don't respect the authority that's present. Um, or they are the authority. They, you know, they're at a authority being they have a high position in an organization or uh, in, in, in a group and they don't have accountability. There's no accountability practices, so they can just do whatever they want. Um, but people who come in with the more narcissistic leanings where they want to control and dominate and they don't, if they're around an authority figure, they have to work for or work with somebody who is the authority that they don't respect, they don't value, who doesn't fit their fantasy of authority that they would be willing to submit to. They do everything to, um, you know, undermine that authority and they become the authority. So we're seeing the cluster B society is like a bullying society where they're just getting away with whatever, because where are the authority? Where did the parents go? Like they're absentee. Where do they go? Or they're too afraid because this is what bullies do. They intimidate, they threaten, and but they're essentially powerless if all their enablers disappear. Wow. So that's kind of like the difference between authoritative leadership and authoritarian, right? So the authoritarians are... Uh, basically just kind of like bullies and the authoritative ones are the ones who can actually kind of like guide things in the door in the right direction. Yeah. They guide, they also respect, you know, the, the difference of opinions, but they're ultimately, they have the vision, they have the skill, they have the ability to see what's required to make sure that we achieve our purpose or we fulfill our purpose. Whereas the others don't necessarily have that ability They'd have lack experience, but they think they're experienced. <laughs> um, they lack, you know, character. They lack, you know, a number of different things. Um, 
So it's the uh, yeah. So what happened to an authoritative society, and did we ever have that? That's a good question, actually. I mean, I know that there was. You think about the American experiment. The American founding. You think about like the Enlightenment and like real kind of liberal, classical liberal values, and it seems like they were kind of based on that um, kind of moral behavior of the individual, moored in kind of traditional values, and with respect for the right of the individual. So, like maybe those frameworks are the checks and balances for inevitable narcissistic behavior. Yeah, I would agree with that, except one thing. So one thing I've, I haven't really spoken about, um, but it's more of a thing I've been pondering. I think enlightenment was very much about the development of intellectual capacity and moral character at the expense of really allowing ourselves to indulge in our emotions. You hear about emotions as the things you can't, you know, the things that you can't control. They're associated with feminine you know, things that are irrational, things that are, you know, like threats, threats to this ideal, which is another type of narcissism, creating a mm -hmm. fantasy perfection. And this is the foundation of all our modern Western institutions, as well as Eastern that's been influenced by Western. So we've suppressed our emotions because we tried to cultivate our character and our intellect and intelligence. So there's going to be a, a pressure cooker situation that's been created that these emotions need to come out. I think this is what we're seeing now. This is society. It's kind of like, now nah, it's a free for all. We all, we all have to feel good. We have to, feel, you know, we can't feel bad. We have to be in our feelings and we need that come to a balance. So we've had the time of the enlightenment and its influence um, and its influence our understanding of human body and medicine. And, you know, a lot of there's, you know, the cringe where there's an understanding that if you suppress your emotions or you have trauma, which can lead to, you know, compartmentalization of emotions, you're, again, if you're not dealing with it, it's going to manifest in your physical body. It's going to manifest in your relationships. Gonna, it needs an outlet. Um, same with intergenerational trauma. You know, things need an outlet. So this is the outlet's just too much. And if we think about what we've been through in the last, you know, two, three years with COVID, a whole bunch, you know, it was traumatizing for many. Um, and so, yeah, it's got to it's got to come out. So I think it's that. And I think after enough venting, which I think we're getting to that point, if I look at the conversations online with the exposure of, say, Claudine Gay and um or, yeah, exposing herself um, and this going going back again, pushing back against the, you know, wokest kind of um, control. Um, I think we're moving towards trying to find a balance where we acknowledge and, and honor that we have feelings about things, but we have a rational approach to working with them to move towards our desired outcome. That's, individually, interpersonally, and as a society. That's so, so nice to hear, Natalie, and I hadn't thought of that before. So thank you for that insight. But I think that you're really onto something. I mean, if we look at the conservative movement, it's like facts, not feelings. And if we look at the progressive movement, it's all feelings. That's it. <laughs> not so many facts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? So... Maybe that is what kind of Western Civ, in a way, didn't nurture enough, was like this idea that we also, you know, it's not only about keeping your feelings in check, right? Like, there's a difference, I think, between controlling your feelings and controlling your behaviors, and maybe that's what's been missing is has been like control your feelings have self-control rather than control what you do about these feelings exactly which is the essence of hacking narcissism so it's china i've been trying to help people understand we have feelings and we have beliefs and our feelings are like our judgments the narratives that we have when we have we're experiencing emotion and emotion is not bad. They're just neutral, but they 
evoke different feelings in our bodies. And we react to that by expressing them as behavior with others because we lack maturity and understanding um, about certain emotions like shame. And shame is fundamental. It's a fundamental emotion that seems to guide all our, all our actions. And because of the really lies and the, you know, negative narratives that we hold when we feel, when we feel the shame and it causes us to, you know, try to control and dominate all the things that we've talked about. So we need a way, uh, or there are many ways to, it's more than just having better quality thoughts and critical thinking. We need to be able to divorce the emotion from the narrative or the belief when we have feelings about anything. And when we're able to go through a process, we're like, I'm having an experience. I'm having a feeling. It's making me want to like throttle this person. But instead, <laughs> I need to do something differently because throttling is harm and it's not a good look for me. And I'm going to have to clean up this mess and repair that damage, all that. I don't need that. <laughs> uh, I need to find a way to go, okay, it's just the feeling. These are the things I'm thinking about myself. They're all bullshit. Um, or some of it might be true, but I'm, I'm not in a position to, you know, um, respond properly. I need, I need a moment. So like when you said, just pause and say nothing, that's the moment. That's the kind of like thoughts and feelings. I need to kind of divorce them temporarily so that I can move through this moment and go, okay, this is my response. And it's a response that's a lot congruent with my values or my principles. So divor it takes work. So divorcing. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a lifelong project, I think. And it's like divorcing that emotion from that narrative is the key then is basically saying, okay, this is, these are two different things here. Like, because in the narrative, you're either going to be, and this brings me to the next thing I want to ask you about. You're either one of three people in the narrative, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the Carpen drama triangle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what is it? What is it? <laughs> you're all, you tend to enter into victim. So we default into victim because when we're feeling shame, we're feeling threatened, there's danger. They're seeing me in the way I don't want to see them. My whole worldview is being challenged. I'm at the, I'm at the mercy of them. So I'm, the, I'm the victim. We never default into the perpetrator. We never think that we're the bad ones, that we're the ones, you know, we don't. Right, that's causing fascinating. the problems. So no, you have victim. so you have the victim, the rescuer, and the perpetrator. And I guess in a, in an example that you brought up uh, earlier in the conversation, where you're talking about a friend who like is talking to you about their problems, and you go in to give them advice because you're triggered, that would be like yeah. you're putting yourself in the rescuer role, right? Yes, yes. Which then they so there's the role that you put yourself in, but there's the role that they the other person is perceiving. So while you might think you're the rescuer or the savior, they might see you now as the perpetrator or the persecutor and they're the victim. So it's fascinating the impact we have on other people just through the way we respond to them. Um, so ideally when somebody's upset and you, you don't want to enter into rescuer mode, you want to see them as someone who's capable of solving their problems. They might need a bit of support, but you can be a more of a facilitator of that process rather than the, I'm here to save the day, savior person. But for some people, they want you to be the savior because that's what they're looking for. That's what they need. Um, so they get pissed off when you're not being the savior. <laughs> they get pissed off when you're treating them as someone you're seeing their humanity and you can see that they're capable of making change um, or solving their problems. They want the savior. That's why we need to be explicit about the role. Like, I think you want me to give advice right now, but I know that's not the right thing to do because you're the one walking in your shoes, living your life. I only know what I know. I would like to be able to support you in a different way. What do you think? So it requires a negotiation, which we can't do when we're triggered and we're like, oh, I need to save. <laughs> I think that that's what you just said there is kind of like maybe one of the missing pieces here and what we've talked about is communication, right? So like if you're deciding that you're going to kind of respond more in life, not react, try and become more self-aware, try to hack your own narcissism or try to kind of hack the narcissism of others, see it and be able to call it for what it is without necessarily demonizing other people, which is, you know, part of doing the same kind of behavior. So what's, 
What's the communication look like while you're making these changes with the people around you? So I would refer to the word assertiveness. So you're moving out of assuming people know what you're thinking or doing or assuming you know what they're thinking and doing and asking them, you know, what are you, what, when you say this, what do you mean by that? So that I'm on the same page as you, or when I say this, this is what I mean by that. What are your concepts about this work? So we need to become a little bit more explicit, which means we're not going to have this transactional relating style that we tend to be used to because we think it's more efficient. It's actually not efficient because we end up having misunderstandings and miscommunication and parallel conversations instead of conversations we're actually both on the same page. So we need to be explicit about not justifying, but this is what I'm thinking. Here's what I'm, you know, here's what I mean by this right now, or this is what I need right now. Is that okay? Or is this something that you're able to do with me? So, you know, seeking permission, being explicit, being transparent um, about what we're doing, why we're doing it, or why we're thinking it. Again, you're not going to do this with everyone because if you can't trust the other person and they tend to be more, you know, controlling, domineering, narcissistic, they're just going to weaponize everything you say in your attempt to want to negotiate with them. You need to be wise about who you can do that with because not everyone's going to want to negotiate with you. They just want their way. Right. Um, and then yeah, they drag so you into a kind of circular conversation and then you yeah. then you lose your, your assertiveness, right? Which is the kind of goal. Yeah. Yeah. Or they just don't like your assertiveness and they, you know, uh, retaliate and they try to find, you know, use the different tactics to try to control the conversation. So with those people, you need to be a little more transactional. And with those that you trust, where you, you know that they're prepared to negotiate with you, you're developing, you're bringing all those assumptions to light. You're, you're creating more of an explicit arrangement so that you're clear about each other's expectations. There's no guessing games. There's respect. It's great. It just takes more time. Is there like a clear kind of way for us to distinguish, you know, who is more narcissistic, not in a way to condemn them, but in a way to know how we can, you know, invest our time with different people and whether it's kind of going to work for us to have a more collaborative relationship or not? Like, are there some kind of indicators that people are are willing to meet you and are there really i guess what some people refer to as red flags where you're like i don't think i can go there with this person yeah because that's a tough question because yeah like you said i don't want to condemn anyone and you know we show up differently at the very beginning of a relationship than we do once we have it um once we have this sort of like we've established the status quo of the relationship, we default into our relational templates. And that's when our toxic stuff and our great stuff comes out. At the very beginning, we're our best selves. We want to, you know, make a great, really great first impression. So I like to look at the red flags at the very beginning of a, a relationship, the very first interactions, then the red flags once you've passed that and you're in a, you know, in the middle of the relationship. So is, is that cool to, to yes, do that? Absolutely. Yeah. So the relationship, the red flags at the beginning of relationship. Um, so the obvious ones is if somebody's like love bombing you and just, you know, lapping on all the compliments and trying to almost buy your affection and your loyalty very early on, or they make claims that they feel like they've known you forever. Uh, and they, you know, they share secrets with you. I've never told anyone this before. Stuff like that. You're like, we just met. Why are you assuming you know anything about me and giving me information that you should only share with people you trust? So that tells you they're not so great with boundaries or they have an ulterior motive. They're trying to, you know, rope you in so that you become dependent on them and they might eventually extract money from you like the Tinder swindler, swindler guy or any other con artist. Um, uh, yeah, so those are the kind of the obvious red flags. Um, if you notice your style is more passive in a relationship, in you know, begin, you, having self awareness about yourself and like, are you more likely to kind of go with the flow and you're happy for someone to lead the way? You've already established, like, 
it's already set. A hierarchical relationship is already established right from the start. Um, the going with the flow, I'm easy going. It means that somebody's going to be leading you where they want. And then the moment you say, hey, actually, I'm not happy, happy with where we're going. I want to create change. That's when the drama starts and things can go downhill unless that person's like, okay, well, you never said anything. I'm happy to let's talk about it. Let's, let's do something else. Let's try something else. Then if that's the response you get, and they follow through with it, then you're like, okay, I can continue to trust this person. But if you get, you know, pushback and upheaval, and um, then what you find is a restoration of the status quo, it's not going to be a good relationship for you over time. So it helps to know what your style is. Are you more dominant? Are you more, you know, are you, are you the one who likes to be in control and make all the plans and do all the things and someone, and you're happy for someone to come along with the ride? You might find you'll be resentful of that person later on for not doing anything because you've always been in control, <laughs> nothing for them to do. Um, or the opposite, like I just said, that you're more passive. Then that opens the way to being dominated. Um, and the other thing, and again, that reflects a parent-child, like your relationship with authority. Um, and then the other one, yeah, it's looking at what they do. What are the things that they're doing and saying, and is it congruent with their own behavior? Um, words and, and actions. Noticing words, and actions. words and actions. So if there's an incongruence very early on and you go, oh, I noticed you said this, but you're doing that, or however you might say it, you would look to see what the reaction is. If there's a welcoming to reflection, that's a good sign. If there's a uh, reaction and defensiveness and blaming and all that stuff, like, yeah, this is going to be a bit tough. But how do you know then? So the uh, the flip side of this, right, is knowing these red flags and things. I just saw you retweeted an article last night written by this Gen Z woman, right, mm. who talked yes. about, in a way, this generation is so risk averse. Like everybody's a narcissist. I'm an empath. Uh, they're all red flags. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, but I'm not a red flag. I'm great. That's right. And I'm a social <laughs> yeah. injustice warrior Yeah. on top of that, right? So on the flip side, it's like, okay, yeah, maybe some of these things are red flags, but to what degree do we go to see like all of these Gen Zs now? Like I think it was saying 45% of like men uh, 18 to 25 like hadn't dated anybody or, you know, it. it's like there's – there's a relational problem. There's like a, a void in that generation. Yeah. And again, it's always looking outside. They're the perpetrator. I need to keep myself safe from all these harmful people. That's right. And not thinking that they are just like those other people themselves. So it helps to go, oh, I get, you know, I see the, the defensive when we say stuff like that. Oh, but I do that too. So you know, how can I condemn someone when I'm doing the same thing? So that's when you take the critical thinking to yourself um, and go, okay, this is not a big deal. We can live with this because um, I get to behave this way too. <laughs> but I think that like one of the things that stops us from doing that is about shame. It's like shame stops you sometimes from looking at yourself and from saying, like, from being okay with the fact, like, you just might have behaved narcissistically. Like, what a dirty word. Like, oh, I've, I, I'm, I'm not doing anything like that. You know, I'm perfect. I never behave like a narcissist. Yes. So we could feel shame about shame. Like, shame is debilitating when it causes us to hide or react badly, where we go into, you know, a fight mode. So we attack the other. Um, the other aspects, we tack ourselves and, um, you know, we take ourselves down for something we think we did or because someone had a, a reaction you didn't expect, but you're interpreting it as negative instead of checking, like, you know, checking why that person had that reaction. Or, you know, going through the process of asking, you just assume. So you go into a shame spiral. Um, whereas you can go, yeah, well, I did just do that. You're right. That seems so hard for people to be able to say the honest truth. You're right. I did do that. Yeah, you're right. I did say that. Can I describe what I meant by that? Can I have a redo that came out all wrong? I could see that it landed badly. 
can I, you know, try again? Or can we talk about that? We have to, the, I, what narcissistic behavior does is a disconnector. It causes us to create distance between each other because I feel so ashamed, so ashamed about myself, even though I'm not necessarily aware of it in the moment that I'm isolating or I'm withdrawing. What I need to do is do everything in my power to resist that and seek to stay connected to the other person. Despite me doing something you don't like, I need to find a way to stay con connected to you. It'd be a huge difference in this world if people were be, would be able to act like that, um, you know, if you want to be connected to that person. So I don't know if I'm answering the question, but this is, I guess, a way to override this thing that shame, that our negative experience of shame makes us do. It's like, what if we were just to say, yeah, I did that. You're right. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the thing. Like, it is really hard for for most people, you know, who don't practice it. But if you don't practice it, it's really tough. Like your ego just gets in the way there and it's like, I'm not going to admit any fault until like two days later and like our relationship has been pulled through hell and back. Unless you're Canadian, then sorry is not a problem. <laughs> well, you know, but that's a kind of passive aggressive sorry. It's, it's not necessarily like, you know... <laughs> 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 or the the tropes about Canadians where you know you say sorry for someone else pushing you over and <laughs> well that's exactly it that's what i mean the it's people kind pleaser. of yes that oh people pleaser listen i would like to talk about that as well you know so yeah, let's do it you know tell me about the people pleaser what's a people pleaser what's the essence the people pleaser is the person who always says yes to other people. They deny their own feelings. They might not even be aware of their own needs and values and anything they have because, again, there's a, a true identity. There's an, a, a core identity that they can refer to and go, no, these are not my values or these are not my principles or yes, they are. They just, they morph into, they assimilate into what the other requires of them. And it's an automatic process. And it was a, a lot of the time for children to stay safe with their parents who might have been emotionally irregular, emotionally unpredictable. So I'm just going to be the perfect daughter and never get into trouble and always do what the authority expects me to do so that I'm safe and my needs are met. So that just carries on into our relationships, um, which is difficult because then you're easy, you will get exploited. You'll be, you know, you're likely to um, be mistreated, be a doormat, because your needs don't matter. The other person's matters more. And it's just this automatic program. That sounds like the story of Canadians that you're talking about. It's that kind of story, you know, a lot of the times that you hear. Um, and so it, it becomes a really big societal problem when, you know, people don't deal with their inner lives and um, and don't deal with their relationships and 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 just kind of like go unconsciously through life. You know, I know that Carl Jung had said in one of his last books after the Second World War, like if everybody kind of individuates and, you know, becomes who they are supposed to be, then, you know, I see hope for the world. Because as long as people remain undifferentiated, they turn into this big mob, you know, and they just worship the state, you know, because it's like the post God world, you know, so like talking about Western culture, they'll just worship the state. And then that, you know, has led to everything that he just saw in, in the wars, in the great wars. So um, do you see hope moving forward for humanity, for individuals? I do. Yeah, I do. I do. I think uh, we only look at, you know, human history through whatever lens or narratives that we're looking at. But I do believe there's a larger history. There's like a cosmic history, a planet, you know, a other thing. And this is just a blip in this kind of ocean of a, of a bigger process. So if we're in a time and I, I like to look at Eastern philosophy. So I, I look at, you know, Vedic, Vedic principles or Vedic philosophy. And this is the time of Kali Yuga, Kali Yuga. And Kali Yuga is about, um, you know, it's a time of great immorality, deception, all the things that we're seeing. It's like, okay, so it looks like we're moving according to plan. But if that, if that is part of, you know, understood in a different tradition, 
there's other yugas, there's other phases, epochs that we're, you know, evolving into and things are cyclical and repeat. So immorality is the thing that um, we need to resist or is the thing that easily draws our attention to become, to embody that, then if we want to see something different, it's on us to resist that and try to, you know, tap, tap into some more of an ethical framework or ethical principles and practices. So it does require accountability. It does require transparency. It does require us to be consistent, predictable in some way so that we can create some trust because that has eroded over time because of the checks and balances disappearing. Um, but I think because of this, we're learning, okay, this is what happens when checks and balance disappear. We need to re reinstate these things. So there's a more, there can be more of an intention or willingness because we've learned through our own experience of what happens when we lose these things and we value these things. And so I do see hope. I do see people learning from this stuff. You see people who are hard left who are now more conservative. Um, you know, I'm one of those people, not hard left, but you know, more left was do you some of the language in certain contexts because I see it's a way of communicating with certain groups of people to understand their pain and suffering. But as soon as you start to make that a blanket language terminology for all areas of society or all, you know, all across the political spectrum, you alienate yourself and you become, you know, an enemy. And that is part of, again, Kali Yuga's, if Kali Yuga is this like demonic thing that's trying to control everyone, well, we're playing into it. So I don't want to play into that. I want to outsmart it. So I have to hack my narcissism. I have to help others do that. So I do see hope that there will be an appetite for this kind of learning, character development, ethical development, that sort of thing. Not with everyone, but with, with enough. I love that, Natalie. And uh, maybe you can send me the stuff about Kali Yuga. I know I can plug it in the description below for, I would love to read about it and maybe others will as well. I would definitely recommend them to go read Hacking Narcissism. Your Substack is incredible. They will, you. you know, have great stuff coming into their inbox. You're welcome. And thank you because, uh, you know, just reading your work has been really helpful for me. Like there's practical things that you can do in your daily life. And there's also just bigger picture things for you to think about. And like I said, a really kind of, you're an independent thinker. You have a really out of the box way of looking at things, but you know, it's really um, in integrity with, you know, the, the kind of foundations of narcissism that I've read about before. So um, I think that it's nice that you have hope. I have hope too. You know, I talk about a lot of things on here with different people, but I really remain hopeful. I think that we can, as individuals, hack our narcissism. And, you know, that will will help trickle out into society. Yay. Yeah. So do you have any any last thoughts, anything else you'd like to share? Um... Oh, I said so much. You have. Yeah, that's okay. If you have nothing else to say, that's all right, no. too. Yeah, this work is hard. I think I'll say that. Um, the more you want to develop your character, start to apply some critical analysis and reasoning skills, not only to the things that you see out there, but to what's going on in here, it isn't easy. Uh, it does create more suffering, but you also have longer periods of peace. So because you are more in control of your own behavior, your actions, your perceptions, and you feel better about yourself, you feel more confident. And eventually, the hold that shame has on you or anyone starts to dissipate, and you develop a better relationship with that emotional state, and therefore yourself and your actions and with others just ripples out. So that's yeah that's that's the kind of last thing i wanted to share beautiful natalie martinek thank you so much and i hope to have you here again soon oh, thank you thanks kate <laughs>